I mean, we would use, to get a general idea, obviously things like Google Translate, which are incredibly useful, and Rockmail, for example, as a browser, I don't know whether anyone uses that, but automatically translates it when you open something. Um, but ideally, you've still got to use, particularly for what we do, and for what you, you need to get really somebody who can actually translate something for you. I mean, to give you an idea as well, if, um, I spent some time previously in Libya when I was in Tripoli before it fell. Now, we would all get, you can't text, but we'd all get text messages um, from the government, which is propaganda. Now, I couldn't um, trust the translators that were with us because we were with a government hotel, everyone was a spy effectively, but they'd give us a translation. But to stand up whether that was true or not, I just took a picture and tweeted it. And because I had a big following in the Arab world, I had hundreds of people come back with a translation. Um, and then I could work out, obviously, by looking at them, what was, what was true and what wasn't. Um, so it's just a way of that kind of thing is easy, you know, you can crowdsource it and use social media to get a translation as well as just using your kind of basic translation services. I know investigative journalists who um, are anonymous on Twitter, for example, um, but it all depends on whether, I personally think it all depends on whether your name is out there already. Um, so say, for example, if you were like David Lee or... Um, somebody whose actually name is out there when you publish as an investigative journalist, everybody knows who you are anyway, by actually becoming prominent within somewhere like social media, within something like Twitter, for example, people will actually start giving you things. So I don't know whether anybody remembers, there was a story last year where two 10-year-old boys were arrested um, on the suspicion of raping an eight-year-old girl in London. They eventually were prosecuted for it but, and found guilty, I think, remember. But um, we first broke that story because I was leaked it um, by somebody who followed me for seven months on Twitter. Um, and obviously they gave it to me because they trusted me as a journalist and because I was prominent. And then I just stood it up via another source uh, and then we ran it. Um, so I think there is an argument for, yes, there is an argument for anonymity, particularly if you do the kind of undercover stuff. But if you're actually out there writing anyway or you exist on camera, then actually by having a, a profile, you can get a lot from it. You see, this is, yeah, I mean, this. I could go on all day about this, but um, the, the difference in what Andy does and what I do is that I personally think if you cannot stand up where it's from, you can use it as a tip, a personal tip, but by actually broadcasting it on Twitter, you might take something which is a rumour, which, say for example, may only have 100 followers, and if somebody tweets that so -and -so, somebody famous has been shot, they've only got 100 followers, you haven't stood it up and at the moment it's got a tiny audience. If you take that and retweet it and put it out there, then I could be putting that out to 30,000, including 1,000 who work in the media, and immediately, boom, a rumour's gone haywire on Twitter. Um, and I personally think that unless you can stand it up, you shouldn't run it. So it's almost impossible with a lot of Twitter accounts to actually work out who is, who is the person behind it, you know, unless you can actually speak to them, meet them in person, um, then, or speak to them on the phone, obviously you can do your best, but I think there's a, it's very, very hard to verify things like that. Very hard. And Andy just works on a very different uh, kind of mantra to me, really. He will obviously tweet it, crowdsource it, and say, does anyone else know anything about that? And now, as far as I'm concerned, that's ultimately could be just retweeting a rumour and adding fuel to a fire. Um, but it is very, very difficult to do. But if you stick to, if you look at Twitter, you know, once you guys will leave, you've got, what, 200 people here who are going to be on Twitter, who are all trained journalists. Now you should all be decent, solid piece, sources of information and there are solid journalists out there and the way I use it is that I cast a net across foreign news, so across the world I follow journalists in every single country and then if, say for example something breaks in Yemen, I follow six journalists in Yemen, they're all active, they're going to see it, they're going to retweet it, I'm going to see it, I'm going to stand it up, we're going to have it on air within three, four minutes whereas it might drop on the wires half an hour later. So by actually following accurate pieces of inf sources of information on Twitter, you can get things really quickly, and you don't necessarily have to stand them up. As, well, you stand them up, but you know you, you're speaking to a journalist rather than speaking to a, a punter. And it's very hard. I did time when I was in Tripoli. It was the only way of us talking to the rebels was through social media, so through, through Skype, through Twitter, and you really don't know whether they are who they say they are. And some people would, from what I was told before I got there, you know, some people were taken in by people they thought were rebels who were actually just young guys working for the government. So it's, it's very, very hard to stand things up like that. I think it can, it could do if you were sloppy. 
I think that you you have to be really really careful and not dive in without you know standing it up. But it's twi- I mean what online journalism has created and particularly Twitter, it's turned organisations like the Guardian into a twenty four hour news organisation. You know whereas before it was just the BBC, Sky and CNN, now the Guardian operates twenty four hours online, um, and it has meant that news breaks much, much, much faster. You know, everyone is working to 24 hour news now. Um, and you just have to be very careful and just use the normal kind of techniques to stand things up before you run them, really. And, you know, everyone will make a mistake, but if you, if you drop something on Twitter, it's your personal name attached to it as well. And if you've got it wrong and you're followed by the rest of the media, then you look like a complete tit. The key is be really active. And actually, at people and join in discussions. You know, it's actually about communicating. A lot of journalists, there are many that just tweet and they don't actually interact with other people. The more you interact, the more people might notice you. So I know a lot of kind of young journalists. Josh Halliday is a friend of mine at the Guardian. Does anyone know Josh or follow him on Twitter? You should. Yeah, the rest of you should do. He's, he's really good. Josh um, basically used social media to get noticed by editors of the Guardian. He now works there. You know, if you can actually, if, if you um, prove, you know, can prove that you're quick, you've got good news judgment, then people like myself, other people at international news organisations are going to start following you, you're going to start helping us, then it just rolls from there basically. Um, and it may be that, you know, if something breaks and you're there and you tweet one of us saying, I'm here, do you want some pictures? Then obviously, yeah, we've got no one there, yeah, definitely, we'll take a photo, you're a journal. Then, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing and thinking actually when you go out there, that what this gives you is direct contact with people at international news organisations. I didn't have that when I graduated. Um, and immediately you've got a ticket to just get in contact with people. And the networking ability, the network, networking capabilities from it are huge. Images are difficult, really difficult. I mean, what I use is, um, say for example, if we take an image, so during the Manchester riots, um, I was put in charge of Sky, we ran a social media news desk for. A week because obviously so much was coming out of social media and because of how much I use it, use Twitter I was getting a lot of um, kind of blappy messages messages to me and things so we could be ahead of the game one of the things we use there for images is that um, I put in place a system whereby we use Google Earth for example so we try and contact the person who, who shot the image or took the video get them to tell us where it was get Google Earth up does it look the same yes it does does the weather look right yes it does okay, well, we've done as much as we can, the person says it's there, to actually verify that's where it's from. Um, and there used to be a time when, particularly when, you know, when online was kind of starting to develop and YouTube, that people just stuck stuff on there. But now, so much stuff is kind of regurgitated within those systems that the one you see may be something that was tweeted five hours ago by somebody else and it's been tweeted hundreds of times and the person who tweeted it to you is not the original owner, so you've got to track it back. And it's difficult, but it pays off, you know. With that, does everyone remember the kid who got mugged and got the um, stuff taken out of his back? And this is just a simple thing, but everyone was reporting it was Hackney and um, that that had happened to him. Now, I got in touch with the person who actually filmed it, looked at, um, they told me where it was, looked at Google Earth, cross Street View, cross-referenced it, and it was embarking. You know, that's the equivalent of it being in a different town. You know, you might be saying it's in Mansfield, actually it was in Nottingham. So actually it's important to kind of get right to the root of where these things are from. Yeah, it's weird that. Um, it's kind of been a strange thing that's developed. Um, and there's a few more, there's more people starting to do it now. You know, I think when um, I first started doing it, there weren't many people doing it at all. Um, Jonathan Haynes at The Guardian, does anyone follow Jonathan Haynes? He's told me to, to tell you to follow him anyway, because he wants more followers. Um, but Jonathan's another example of someone who kind of, off the back of what I was doing, is now doing a very similar thing. Other people are starting to pick up on it. And it's, it's interesting because what you end up becoming by, um, by effectively, you're, you're a news broadcasting service. You know, I know a lot of people that don't follow other journalists, they just follow me because I curate all the best news from other places and put it out there. Um, and that's just something you guys can do, you know. It's, you can immediately start to get your own kind of following and become one of those kind of Twitter news anchors. Um, and as a result, people then start giving you stories. And that's key, like I was saying earlier, you have to tweet. You know, I don't know, don't put your hands up if this is you, but there's always people out there who just use Twitter to watch. Now that's great, but if you're not actually actively participating in a conversation, 
you're immediately missing out on people tipping you off. And people will tip you off more and more and more. The more well known you become, the more stories people will tip you off to. So you have to actually actively participate. But yeah, the whole Twitter anchor thing's a bit weird. That is a bit strange. Um, but it seems to have developed and more people are starting to, to do it now. The super injunction thing was uh, a bit ridiculous, if you ask me, I think. Um, there, I mean, a number of people there had, well, the danger, I think it's quite difficult to talk about, but basically the danger is that people, yes, people have um, the ability to publish now. Um, so they can get around the injunctions, etc., by personally publishing. Um, but the people who were doing that, I'm guessing, had some sort of knowledge or second-hand knowledge of the injunctions, and there was obviously a reasoning behind it. And some of those, some of the, some there were some people who were harmed personally um, by those tweets and what people were putting out there because they weren't true. Um, and I think there's a big danger in you know being able to publish is a dangerous thing, and put in the wrong hands is very, very dangerous. And I obviously can't, get, I, we get served obviously all the injunctions on a news desk, you, you're made aware of the injunctions. So obviously there's a limited amount I can talk about because obviously there's things I know, things I don't, so I don't really want to talk about. But yeah, it's, I don't think it's a good thing personally, um, at all. Because a lot of injunctions might be there for a reason. Um, but it's the same with MPs, you know, MPs will stand up and, and maybe break an injunction and actually there's been a few instances recently which have involved childcare issues where they really shouldn't have done what, they, what they've done, I think, in my opinion. The way I work is that with the channel, as soon as, if we have something we're going to break, it goes to the news desk first. To give you an idea of where the system works, has anyone been around Sky? Um, or it's really, a really short chain of command. You have the news desk, so either home or foreign. If a correspondent, say Alex Crawford, phones something in, you know, she's into Weir, so Weir's been liberated. I take that call, I press a buzzer, I buzz through to the gallery, gallery tell the presenter in their ear, the Weir's liberated Sky Correspondent reports, the Weir's been um, captured by the rebels. That hits the strap, and then they start talking about it, and Alex goes through for phono. So it's a really short chain of command. So the way I work is that once phoned in, I will tweet it. And I would never tweet it before phoning it in, if that makes sense. Because ultimately your job is for the channel. Um, but Twitter is just another broadcasting mechanism. But as a freelancer, if not working, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. You know, and that's the same, that's what I realised, is that um, in 2009, I left my first job and moved, no, 2009? Yeah, basically 2009, um, which is when I got on Twitter. And what I realised was as a freelancer, what this allowed me to do was do breaking news when not working. So as a freelancer, a lot of you might end up doing 10 days a month. But you can become known and do your journalism through Twitter, which is effectively just a broadcasting platform. Um, so as a freelancer, I, I don't necessarily worry about it, but on, on a work day, then it's always to the gallery first, and there, there shouldn't be a conflict. The other thing that's worth noting is that with court cases now, you know, we will tweet from a court case. And in the gallery, they stay across everyone's Twitter accounts. So as soon as you break something, you know, Martin Brunt, bang, hits, the, hits the Twitter, that hits the strap, and then immediately it's on air. So there is the other way around where Twitter may be first, but it's in instances where we're locked in. Um, and that's the other thing to remember is, whenever you put things on Twitter, you are publishing, you know, ultimately. And it is your professional, I don't have a CV anymore, I barely use a CV because people know me through Twitter, and if they follow me and they're within the industry, they know what I've done, where I've worked. Um, so you have to think of it as professional, and when you run something, you need to make sure it's right. Um, and it should, it should run on Twitter in the same way that it would run on, on say, the strap on Sky. Otherwise, again, you look like a bit of a fool if you're wrong. Well, I think a lot of people, when they first got into Twitter, saw it as quite chaotic, and it is by its nature quite chaotic. There's a hell of a lot of voices out there. Um, but if the way I work is to actually use it in a really structured way and effectively create my own newswire, which is what you guys can do, whether you're working on home news or foreign news or you know, wherever. So by looking at, when I used to work on home news, I would um, follow all of the police forces because most of them tweet the press releases before they put them on the voice bank. You know, the whole calling around the voice bank thing is dead because they drop it on Twitter. So if you're following them, you don't need to go calling voice banks anymore. Um, you know, then I would look at 
all of the kind of major politicians, then I would look at um, all of the ambulance forces, I would also look at all of the other journalists because I want to know what the opposition are doing because if the opposition tweets something I need to make sure that I'm across it and they will, so Channel 4 News aren't a 24 hour news channel but they've made the decision now that they put things out when they get it um, online so you'll see them run things on Twitter, now you need to stay across that so I would structure the way I was following all the other journalists in my area um, and just basically build it like a net effectively just like you would work any patch as a, as a traditional journal. And that's the same, if you go and work in a region, you can do exactly the same thing. So um, I've done some work with some of our regional correspondents where they use Twitter in exactly the same way. And what it means is when you log in and look through your feed, if you go through the last two hours when you get up, you've basically got all the news from the day. But you, as, as soon as things drop, you can kind of jump on them straight away. Um, so it's about that kind of structure. So now I'm on foreign, I've just taken it into an international um, stage and, and follow journalists in every country, all the major kind of military forces, all of those kind of things as well. Um, it's just a news wire basically, um, but you just have to be aware of just it's who you follow um, is the important thing. You have to interact with them and that's the key thing, you know, people give me things every day that I don't need, but by interacting and saying thanks, didn't know that, etc., then, or, you know, I'll check it out then you've at least interacted and given them something back. If you just stonewall them, then they're not going to do it again. And although the first time they may give you something that's completely useless, because most people out there don't have news judgment, um, decent news judgment, which you guys will have when you, you know, graduated, but they, um, the next time they may give you something that's incredibly valuable. So it's about kind of nurturing that and just interacting. And that's the, the mistake a lot of people make, is not to interact. And it's a huge, huge error, because you, you really lose out. It's, you know, I get asked that quite a lot actually. If it is superseded, then we just have to take whatever supersedes it and jump on it. But one of the things that would surprise me is if it is for news. Because ultimately what Twitter is, is a headline. Um, and it, you cannot get any shorter and quicker than that. And you can link to something and it's short. As soon as you make it longer, if anyone sees people who use Twit longer all the time, it's just irritating because you don't want to read it. Um, Cora, for example, for me is not something that I'm interested in. But Twitter is incredibly quick. Um, also, people just love news, you know, whether it be actually news that I work in or fashion news or you know, music news, and they can get it and structure their own news feed within Twitter really, really easily. So, I mean, I think it would take a lot for something to supersede it. It may well happen, and if it does, as journalists, we just have to jump on whatever's, whatever's next and whatever's best, really. But at the moment, it is the kind of the best thing for us and the quickest way to contact people. I think the first key thing is you have to decide what it's for. If, if it's for your career, which realistically it should be, if you ask me at the moment, you should have one for your career, um, then you need to give across some personality. Nobody likes a robot, you know, they are really boring. But if you can actually give personality across, then that's really important. But there, I think there's a limit, you know, you, people will follow you because they're interested in news. So you've just got to be careful of, A, future employers who are probably following you anyway, um, and what they see, um, but also just flooding your newsfeed with things that people aren't interested in. Um, and I keep a lot off Twitter, um, a lot of things I do personally I don't tweet about, um, and there's a lot of things people aren't aware of that I do in a kind of personal capacity. Um, and I did used to have a feed for a, a Twitter account for the sport I did, um, but in the end I just couldn't keep the two going, so I just let that one go. Um, but I think you just have to be aware of what you're using it for and a bit of personality is fine, but there is a limit really. No, Sky is absolutely brilliant and great. I mean, if you, I don't know whether you follow those other people at Sky, but it's something that's kind of become key to what we do. Um, and it's, Sky is a great place to innovate and try and bring things in. Um, and all the way since the very beginning, it's kind of been nurtured and pushed forward and spread across the channel. Um, so now you'll see all our correspondents are on there, our cameramen are on there, our sound engineers are on there. You know, if you really want to know how we work on the ground and the difficulties we have, you can see it. But if you also want to know, you know what the other producers are doing or the correspondents, their analysis and things, you can see that as well. So there's never really, I've never had a conflict with them at all. And Sky's really kind of grabbed it and, and pushed and run with it really. It is difficult because there is a curse involved as well. You know, if you become 
like you were saying earlier on one of the kind of Twitter anchors you just have to be on there the whole time otherwise people go away so that is a bit of a curse um, having a, a iPhone helps because you can just be on it all the time but you know um, it's just really really hard and also for break, I work in breaking news so it's very different as well you know like someone, you might tip me off to something that you know a huge story and if I've gone oh, I'm not going to look at Twitter for four hours and then sure enough you tip me off two hours before it happened and then everyone else broke it later then I'd really kick myself so I think working in 24 hour news it makes it worse um, but it is really hard really really hard and particularly kind of and you, and you have to be very yeah be very very careful when you go out when it comes to having a few drinks and using particularly when it becomes like your professional account you've just got to be very careful and that's the danger about having two accounts as well it can go horribly wrong <laughs>
because on the news desk in particular you've got the wires you've got all the pictures coming in you've got everything else you're dealing with you're dealing with all the feeds we've got from our bureaus and things so there is a limit that I can actually stay across um, and on a day-to-day -day basis realistically it is probably it's probably only those two um, but it's more because I'm limited by all the other content that I'm having to deal with um, and also being mobile um, and how much time Twitter takes me is the other issue um, and I have to, yeah, there's not, I wouldn't say there's much more that I actually use um, other than that, really, at the moment.